Welcome to the Voice of His Blood Ministries. Carol and I are inviting you to join our team of prayer warriors for Israel. I don't think I need to tell you that we're, we are living in perilous times and that the nation of Israel is surrounded by her enemies. We are recruiting the world over for those hidden ones, called out by the Lord to stand in the gap for the nation of Israel and the eternal city of Jerusalem. When we were called into the ministry over 25 years ago, the Holy Spirit had spoken a prophetic word over us through our pastor, telling us that what God had called us to do had been planned for centuries and it was for an appointed time. I have always been led into spiritual warfare by the Holy Spirit during the duration of my ministry. Then suddenly two years ago, I began to pray for the nation of Israel during my daily prayer time. You know, the Holy Spirit has had us in training for over 25 years, teaching us the divine order of spiritual warfare and how to implement this knowledge. At the time of being trained by the Holy Spirit, I had focused primarily on what the Bible calls strongholds within the believer. As the Lord continued to expand my spiritual authority over darkness, He also expanded my spiritual territory. And all of a sudden, I was at the gates of Jerusalem in spiritual warfare. The Lord has shown us this spiritual warfare training for the past 25 years has not only been for our ministry, but also to be able to train prayer warriors for the nation of Israel and the eternal city of Jerusalem preceding <clears throat> the rapture of the church. My dear people, the appointed time has arrived and it's now. We're not only recruiting warriors, but also leaders to start their own prayer groups in their areas of influence, such as home groups or within the local church all over the world. If you believe that you are one of God's hidden ones called out by His name, we welcome you into our world prayer team for this end-time ministry. Training is provided to enable you to become an effective prayer warrior for God in an easy-to-understand format that is available on our website for you to download at no cost to you. Be sure to download the introduction information first. Then follow the order of study with downloads 1 through 10. My dear people, we welcome you to this end time move of God. First of all, I need to explain to you that when you enter into spiritual warfare for the nation of Israel and the eternal city of Jerusalem, that in the beginning of warfare, you are going to have resistance from the enemy of our soul. You see, Satan and his evil armies want to stop us before we start. You will notice that in my teaching about spiritual warfare, I begin by teaching you about strongholds. You may wonder, why why strongholds? Well, you see, my dear people, as we begin to enter into warfare with the enemy for the nation of Israel, the enemy will use any strongholds of the flesh that we may have to try to overcome us and to stop us. God Almighty has more than equipped us for this spiritual battle. However, we need to be taught how to recognize the strategies of the enemy. You see, my dear people, I am teaching you the very same way God taught me how to overcome strongholds of the flesh and how to recognize them. My dear people, we must have this spiritual knowledge. You see, this spiritual knowledge is the first key to winning the battle that we are called to do for the nation of Israel and the eternal city of Jerusalem. There are many believers today that God calls His hidden ones that have been called for this end-time ministry. Today's churches are filled with believers that want to be used by God. And you may well be one of God's hidden ones due to the fact that you have a heart for God and want to serve Him. You see, my dear people, we are not only recruiting for God's army, but also for leaders to form prayer groups in their homes and their churches. You must recognize that Satan has no power. Satan can only deceive us. You see, my dear people, as you well know, we are entering into the end time move of God. And God wants us to walk in holiness and his power. We cannot change what we won't acknowledge. And we must be willing to deal with the real us. The enemy of our soul has deceived us. God's overcomers must learn how to use the authority of Jesus in their lives. And also to learn how to overcome the enemy of our soul. You see, my dear people, we as overcomers must be faithful in denying self, the world, and Satan, and at the same time know how to exercise the authority of the voice of his blood. Authoritative prayer is not a prayer of petition, it is a commanding prayer. Commanding prayer commences at the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, my dear people, the death and resurrection of Jesus was and is a creative act. 
The old man is dead, and we are new creatures through him, new men. You see, my dear people, when we ascended with Jesus and are seated in heavenly places with him, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. Ordinary prayer is praying from earth to heaven. Commanding prayer is praying from heaven to earth. Mark eleven twenty three tells us, For verily, verily, I say unto you, that whatsoever shall say, you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. You see, my dear people, we are to command the situations in our lives to be removed. And this is authority of prayer. This is not asking God to deal with a mountain in our lives, or in other words, the hindrances in our lives. You see, my dear people, we are to command what God has already commanded. The words in our mouth are the same as the words in God's mouth when spoken through the authority of Jesus Christ. We are the voice of his blood. Did you hear me? We are the voice of his blood. And the, there are ten spiritual moves, or in other words, ten spiritual keys that are required by God to be able to walk this walk. And it takes a combination of these ten spiritual keys to open the, the combination lock to the power of the supernatural realm. And what I'm, what I'm teaching you right now is this, spirit, this first spiritual key, which is knowledge. You see, my dear people, the opening of the eyes of our understanding and spiritual, word, uh, the spiritual knowledge to the truth of God's word is absolutely necessary for deliverance from the spirit of deception. Without opening the eyes of our spiritual understanding, freedom is impossible, not only for ourselves, but uh, for, for anyone else. Satan can actually overcome us and bring us into bondage, even when we believe God by faith, if we do not exert action in the spiritual realm. When you have discerned the deception of the enemy, and recognize the conversations of the enemy within the mind and the wills of the flesh, you will begin to gain ground on the enemy of your soul. Deception unlatches the gate for evil spirits to come in, and passivity provides a place for them to stay. This combination of deception and passivity equals entrenchment of the soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. The common factor for entrenchment is the inactivity of your own God-given free will. We as Christians in our ignorance have been deceived by the powers of darkness and have fulfilled the conditions for the enemy to work in our lives. There are four steps that the enemy lays down to try to trap us. The first one is ignorance. In other words, a lack of spiritual knowledge, education, or being unaware of the enemy at work in our lives. The second is deception. A deliberate act by the enemy to deprive us of our God-given free freedom paid for in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the third one is passivity, which is, is, is uh, inactivity, inactivity on our behalf, exerting no resistance in the spiritual realm against the enemy of our soul. And, of course, the fourth is entrenchment. Entrenchment is where the enemy has fortified his stronghold and taken the Christian captive by the combination of ignorance, deception, and our own passivity. We are going to teach you how to overcome entrenchment of the soul. It is imperative that you follow the instructions we are teaching you. If you're not teachable, then we can't help you. Entrenchment is the stronghold that is causing you to do the things that are contrary to the Word of God. When you have a situation in your life that is controlling you and you're not able to stop or overcome it in the natural, you are entrenched by the enemy of your soul. This is, entrenchment can also be called an addiction. To give you a prime example, is for those that are addicted to pornography. In other words, they have no control over it. And you may have a cycle, for instance, in your life of anger, or depression, fear, low self-esteem, oppression, past hurts, self-pity, or even rage. And this cycle happens every day or once a week periodically. You see, my dear people, there are many strongholds that the enemy will use to entrap you and try to stop you before you start to, into spiritual warfare. It does not matter the depth of the entrenchment as long as you decide daily to choose the will of God in your life and do it. This attitude will give God the opportunity to work his will in you and cause the influence of strongholds and wills of the flesh at work to weaken, which in turn will strengthen you spiritually. We must allow the Holy Spirit to rule over our renewed mind, 
will, and emotions. When we are as children of God allow the flesh to rule, we will re be rebellious to the things of God. When the Holy Spirit is allowed to rule, we produce spiritual fruit and the power of self-control. You know, the Word of God tells us in Proverbs 25, 28, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. You know, my dear people, the blood of Jesus Christ has done absolute wonders for us, and many of us don't really realize what he's done. First of all, we have been born again by the blood, saved from eternal death and separation from God. We have been redeemed by the blood, which is bought back from the power of sin and death. We have received atonement by the blood, the act of which God restores a relationship of harmony and unity between himself and human beings. We have been made righteous by the blood. This is where God transfers the righteousness of Jesus to those who trust in him. We are sanctified by the blood. This is the process of God's grace by which he are, we are separated from sin. We are justified by the blood. This is where God charges the sin of man to Jesus and credits the righteousness of Jesus to the believer. We are re reconciled by the blood. This is the incentive, uh, uh, initiative that was taken by God while we were still sinners and enemies. God has re reconciled us to himself. Thank you, Jesus. We are forgiven by the blood. God has pardoned the sin of human beings. You see, my dear people, and we have been delivered by the blood. This is where the act of being delivered from the power of darkness and set at liberty from captivity. You see, my dear people, we have received overcoming power by the blood. The power we receive when we act upon what has been delegated to us. Jesus himself said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, and nothing <coughs> shall be by any means or hurt you. You see, my dear people, we have been born again by the blood, <coughs> excuse me, redeemed by the blood, received atonement by the blood, made righteous by the blood, sanctified by the blood, justified by the blood, reconciled by the blood, forgiven by the blood, delivered by the blood, received overcoming power by the blood. So what's the problem? Why do people have problems today? Quite frankly, because we're not walking in the overcoming power that has been given to us by the blood. Walking in overcoming power is the only way to overcome addictions. And over, walking in overcoming power is the only way to overcome sin, flesh, and the devils. You see, my dear people, strongholds are not spiritual problems and and must be dealt with according to the spiritual instruction given to us by God. Paul the Apostle tells us in Galatians 3, 3, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Many Christians are born again and bound, resurrected and not yet released, pri prisoners in a promised land. Many are bound by strongholds of the enemy and don't realize it, or believe God for their deliverance by faith when the price has already been paid for in full at the cross by the blood. By the blood. Every born again child of God that I've ever met has a desire to become the overcomer that talks about, the Bible talks about, to overcome behavior problems of the flesh, the old self life. The Bible tells us in Hosea 4 6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. You see, my dear people, this is why this spiritual key, the very first spiritual key to warfare is spiritual knowledge. This knowledge is spiritual knowledge, and without spiritual knowledge, we aren't vulnerable to the enemy of our soul. Paul the Apostle tells us in Colossians 1, 9, For this cause, uh, excuse me, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The battle of the wills, uh, whom we're going to serve uh, between our flesh and our spirit man is a daily battle. And to, be over, to become an overcomer, this battle must be won in the mind. Because you see, my dear people, the, the enemy uses the mind for a battleground. You see, my dear people, our soul consists of three parts. Our mind, will, and emotion. And each has its own will. And we must remember this, as the enemy will use one or all of these to try to ascend over us and take us captive in the process. You see, <clears throat> my dear people, when God created us, he gave us a free will to choose daily to overcome sin, flesh, and the devil. He gave his church and a believer authority on this earth to be an overcomer of sin, flesh, and the devil.
I'm going to read to you a letter to the Church of Jesus Christ from Paul the Apostle. And we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, now who's he speaking to there? He's speaking to us. They give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding, whose understanding? Our understanding, being enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of glory of his inheritance in, in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. Power to who? To us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So why is Paul the Apostle praying that we have the eyes of our understanding enlightened? Very simple, that we may receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and know what is the hope of God's calling of his greatness of his power given to us. Because you see, my dear people, the eyes of our understanding have been blinded by darkness. We have been deceived by darkness about the power given to us. We read in Ephesians 4.18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. What understanding? Spiritual understanding about spiritual power. Matthew 15, 16, Jesus said, Are you also without understanding? You see, my dear people, we must have spiritual understanding to understand the mysteries of God. So I'm going to teach you the source of strongholds, the wills of the flesh, and how they operate within the soul of the believer. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imagination to every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So what are these strongholds the word of God is speaking of? Well, first of all, a stronghold sets in the center of a fortification surrounded by two walls. Around the stronghold is a wall called arguments, theories, and reasonings. In other words, these are thoughts from the enemy's camp. Around the first wall is a, is a second wall that's called high and lofty things. That's pride. And both of these fortified walls must come down. In the center of the fortification is the root of the stronghold that was placed there by the enemy of our soul. The, the, uh, Romans eleven sixteen tells us, If the root be holy, so are the branches. Because we are created in the image of God, we are made up of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. God is spirit and created us. So which was created first, spirit, soul, or body? The spirit, you see, for the spirit of God created our soul and our body. As born-again Christian, our spirit is born again, instantly, set free from the power of sin and death, and brought into right standing with God. You see, my dear people, we are new creatures through Christ Jesus. Our soul and our body, although, are not born again. And this is why we are told in God's Word to renew our minds to the Word of God. You see, my dear people, we live in our body that will be redeemed at the rapture, either alive or from the grave, for our body is a physical container of our spirit and our soul. The Bible calls it our tabernacle, or temple, or a clay pot. We read in 2 Corinthians 10.5, Inasmuch as we re refute arguments and theories and reasonings, you see, my dear people, arguments, theories, and reasonings come from the mind and are this first wall of fortification. These arguments, theories, and reasonings come from the mind, not from the spirit or the body. Why? Because our spirit man is born again. Our body is our container or our vessel. And our soul is our personality, which is also made up of three parts. Mind, will, emotion. Mind is how we think. Will is how we behave. And emotions is how we feel. All sin, all sin originates in the mind in the form of a thought, fiery dart, or a temptation. And this is why the mind is the battleground. It is important to understand this as the Bible teaches us that we are inhabited by the Spirit of God and that the Spirit does not produce sin. 
You see, my dear people, our spirit does not produce sin because we are partakers of our Father's divine nature. 2 Peter 1, 4. Yet, the Bible makes it clear that a Christian can sin. Romans 7, 23. If we read Romans 7, 23 from the Amplified, it says, the word says, but I discern, <coughs> excuse me, but I discern in my bodily members, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh, a different law, a rule of action, a war against the law of my mind, in other words, my reasoning, and making me prisoner to the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs, in other words, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh. You see, my dear people, our flesh is our enemy. We have sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh at war with our mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Sin does not originate in the believer's spirit. 2 Peter 1, 4. Sin originates in the mind in the form of a temptation, a thought, or fiery dart. You see, my dear people, it is the flesh that sins, not your spirit. And Paul the Apostle is speaking in Romans 7, 23 of the sin nature and the wills of the flesh. So what are the wills of the flesh? I'm going to give an example. Let's take obesity. Have you ever noticed or have you ever seen an overweight Jewish person in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany during World War II? Well, no. Because you see, the Jewish people were dominated by the Gestapo who took over, over uh, their will by not allowing them to eat. And this is a picture of how Satan operates. You see, my dear people, the Gestapo overrode their will, took them captive, and made slaves out of them. Well, Satan wants to override our will, take us captive, and make us slaves to sin. Satan wants to override our will using strongholds of the mind and wills of the flesh. You see, my dear people, prior to being born again, Satan did control us through the sin nature. However, as a born-again Christian, Satan cannot legally do so because we have been delivered from the power of sin and death, Romans 8, 2. Also, our old man died with Jesus on the cross, Romans 6, 6. We must give the enemy ground by an act of our own free will. You see, my dear people, Satan will use strongholds from our past prior to being born again to tempt our flesh to sin. This is why we read in Galatians 3, 3, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You see, my dear people, the flesh has its own will. Well, you may say, well, what is the flesh? What is the flesh? Well, the flesh is the earthly part of man that represents lust and desires. That's our earthly nature. And this is why people have addictions, because you see, addictions are located in the flesh. Flesh is the earthly nature of man. So let me ask you something. Is it the flesh that sins and not your spirit? It, or is a stronghold an evil spirit? No. You see, because flesh is not born again. A stronghold is the vehicle used by evil spirits to tempt our flesh that in turn triggers a reaction if we will allow it to do so. You see, my dear people, we must still act upon the temptation by an act of our own free will. We have a free will. I'm going to say that again. We have a God-given free will. And strongholds are the habits, behavior, and thought patterns that were built up within our mind and our flesh while we were still servants of sin. These habits, behavior, and thought patterns leave us exposed to the enemy's influence and deception. And although we are born again, we still have to overcome the sin nature. We still have to overcome sinful flesh. That is why Paul calls it wills of the flesh. Why? Because flesh is addicted to what it likes. Flesh is not born again. Flesh likes whatever gives it pleasure. Satan knows that he can attempt our flesh. He has an opportunity to give his hooks in us and to strengthen his strongholds. Strongholds destroy our opportunity to live the abundant life. Strongholds make us prisoners in the promised land. Born again and bound. You see, my dear people, individual strongholds can differ from person to person, and yet they uh, have certain characteristics that remain constant. Most people give up and simply learn to live with them. Some are subdued uh, through med medication or drugs or alcohol. But you see, my dear people, what are the main characteristics of strongholds? Well, first of all, strongholds are stubborn. If we attack them on our own strength, they will reappear over and over again. Secondly, strongholds are uncontrollable. If you have a habit, 
or behavior problem that controls you, or a cycle that is repetitive, such as anger, criticism, discouragement. You have a stronghold in your life, and there, there are many strongholds. Thirdly, strongholds of a sexual nature. Sexual nature are normally your deepest, darkest secret. With God's supernatural weapons, such as strongholds, uh, such strongholds are destroyed. Most Christians do not realize they have strongholds until the Lord shows them to you. Before being born again, we were servants of sin. Take a look at us before our condition prior to being born again. We read in Ephesians 2, chapters 1 through 3, Paul the Apostle writes, And you, who's he talking to here? He's talking to us. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespass and sin. This is before we were born again. Wherein in times past, that was in the past, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, another it words, evil spirits, among whom also we, who, all of us, had our conversation, in other words, we had this conversation going on in our mind, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You see, my dear people, most Christians, are you listening? Most Christians are still having these conversations, these very same conversations with the enemy of their soul. A conversation, my dear people, <clears throat> is a two-way communication. These conversations in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, are the foundation of strongholds. So what is this conversation in times past? Well, remember, first of all, that a stronghold is a vehicle used by evil spirits to override your free will. You see, my dear people, evil spirits use strongholds of lust within the mind to bring to your remembrance the pleasures of their experiences of past sin, especially sexual sin, to entice you to act upon these thoughts and temptations. Evil spirits use strongholds of lust within the mind to bring forth fantasies and vain imaginations. Evil spirits use strongholds to tempt your flesh to sin against the Holy Spirit of God. Excuse me. Excuse <coughs> <coughs> me. Evil spirits use strongholds of conversation to get you angry, bitter, or to make you criticize someone. Evil spirits use strongholds of conversation to bring discouragement and oppress you. Evil spirits use conversations to make you fearful. Evil spirits use strongholds of conversations to make you greedy or impatient. Evil spirits use strongholds of conversation to tempt you to tell lies. Evil spirits use conversations to bring to your remembrance past hurts, rejection, or low self-esteem. Evil spirits use strongholds of conversation with yourself to bring about self-pity and selfishness. Evil spirits use strongholds of conversations to tempt you to steal. Evil spirits use conversation of doubt and unbelief or worry. Evil spirits use strongholds of unforgiveness. Evil spirits use strongholds of lust of the flesh to bring to your remembrance of pleasures and experiences of past sin, <coughs> especially sexual sin, to keep you addicted. These are only a few of the strongholds the enemy is using to destroy our abundant life. So what does the Word of God tell us to do? Well, if we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22, 27, and 30, the Word of God tells us that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. What conversation? The conversation you were having back in Ephesians chapter 2. In other words, we weren't born again. You see, we are to put off those former conversations the old, of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. Then what does it say in verse 23? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. You see, my dear people... <laughs> We are to put off these former conversations of the old man. We are to be renewed in our mind, and we are to put on the new man. We are to give no place to the devil, and we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Thoughts, fiery darts, evil spirits use strongholds of conversations with our mind to get our flesh to sin. Why does the Word of God call them fiery darts? 
because they are able to start a raging fire in our flesh if they are not quenched. A raging fire of the flesh that we want to put out using carnal methods. We have to use supernatural spiritual power from God to overcome these fiery darts. Now, my dear people, God has not left us defenseless against forces of darkness. Our weapons have been fashioned and issued by God. We have supernatural spiritual weapons capable of withstanding and overcoming principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness to change the old man to the new man through Jesus Christ, to change the old behavior to new behavior, to live the abundant life. <clears throat> we read in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. What is the power of His might? It's the Holy Ghost. Put on the whole mar armor, in other words, all of it, that you may be able to stand against the wiles, in other words, strategies of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, in other words, we don't wrestle against people, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor, in other words, all of it, of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. How many of you know that we are in the evil day this very moment? You better believe it. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts, in other words, the thoughts, the temptations of the wicked one. And take the hem helmet of salvation and the, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You notice there, when it talks about the sword of the Spirit, there's no scabbard. What's a scabbard? That's where you're supposed to store your sword. You see, but today's Christian, you're not supposed to store your sword. You're supposed to keep it uh, active all the time with the Word of God. And then it tells us, uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In other words, in your heavenly language, in tongues, uh, and watching there unto but all perseverance and supplications for all saints. You see, my dear people, verse 16 tells us what? Talks about fiery darts. In other words, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts, the thoughts, the temptations of the wicked one. And that's what Satan's going to hit you with when you start warring in the spirit for the nation of Israel and the eternal city of Jerusalem. My dear people, you must realize that God is with us. God wants us to overcome. For you see, my dear people, our weapons have been fashioned and issued. These supernatural spiritual weapons are more than capable. Did you hear me? They're more than capable because God is almighty. They're capable, more than capable, of overcoming principalities, rulers, and spirits of darkness. For we read in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, in other words, they're not fleshy, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So what do you have to do to overcome these strongholds of the enemy? What do you have to do to overcome addictions that are in your flesh? It tells you right there in Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor. In other words, put it all on that you may be able to stand against the strategies of the devil. Why? So that you'll be able to quench the fiery darts, thoughts, temptations of the wicked one. That's Ephesians 6.16. You see, my dear people, you must have a revelation that you can overcome. Believing that we can overcome is the first phase of the battle. Fight every thought of defeat from the enemy. Satan wants to stop you before you start. Satan is using strongholds of the mind and temptations of the flesh. Satan does this to capture our free will to get us to sin against the Holy God by an act of our own free will. And those suffering from this problem have to be taught how to overcome these thoughts and temptations. My dear people, this is a spiritual battle that will have to be won. For strongholds do not go away by themselves. They must be overcome. And my dear people, please remember this when you enter into the fray. When you enter into spiritual warfare uh, for the nation of Israel and the eternal city of Jerusalem. Because the enemy will come at you with your trying to, to get you to sin against your flesh, to get you out of fellowship with God. Well, hallelujah. But again, this is the, the first lesson. Please move on to number, lesson number two. Lord bless you.